that one of the great changes in the 20th century, there's no doubt about it, it's a radical change, um, has been the feminist revolution. And what is very ironic is to notice that many of the leaders of the return to halakha in the reform movement are women rabbis, which and I, I just find that <laughs> very, uh, very, very ironic. That is, their presence represents the what? The revolution. That's right. It, it is totally non-traditional. But what they're recommending is the return to uh, <laughs> the, uh, the halakha. And I, I, uh, I've been in conversation with several such rabbis, and I've always found it deliciously ironic. But there's no doubt about it, even if you want to be traditional, the 20th century has made you non-traditional. All right. Now, what it, what it has meant, by the way, is that after centuries of being deprived of the skills of women in Jewish life, in Ju as leaders, uh, and rabbis, but just generally as leaders, we now have many women who are participating in the work of creating uh, a new Judaism, or who are in the, the struggle for developing what I call an appropriate Jewish identity for the end of the 20th century and beginning of the 20, 21st. One of those people uh, who is very well known uh, throughout North America and beyond is Marsha Falk. There is a book out there which is called The Book of Blessings. And uh, I cannot tell you how many rabbis and congregations use that material because it is regarded as a very, very important development. And in fact, uh, Marsha Falk has uh, many skills for producing a new kind of liturgy, and I'm going to get to the word liturgy in just a moment. She is a poet and a translator uh, in both English and Hebrew. Um, she is a university professor, and she has uh, been a fellow at the Hebrew University, a Fulbright scholar, uh, many distinguished honors. She graduated in comparative literature from Stanford University, having gotten her first degree from Brandeis University. Uh, and she has dealt with a fundamental issue. It's a fundamental issue because at the heart of traditional ritual life is something called prayer. Now, the issue with prayer is, can prayer and liturgy, which is attached to it, still be significant if you can no longer believe in the ideas which initially prompted those prayers? And we had this discussion, by the way, uh, yesterday. It's a very important area, the whole area of celebration. One way of dealing with it, obviously, is rejection. And many of us have certainly engaged in that, which is to say the old liturgy or prayers are unusable. It's ideologically unacceptable. We have to go out and what? Do our, create a whole new thing. And then we heard the reconstructionist point of view, right? The reconstructionist point of view. And it was also the view to, to a large degree in the reform movement because many of the reform rabbis that I knew when I was reform, no, uh, many, uh, many of those rabbis also were engaged in redefining terms. That was, uh, you may cut down on the liturgy and remove the most assaultive or offensive phrases, but in the end you keep it and you what? Redefine the terms with all the problems or advantages that that may, may produce. But there may be a third alternative. The third alternative is the bridge between the two. Because obviously, for many, many Jews, there is a strong emotional attachment to the idea of prayer and liturgy. 
And in fact, is there some way of creating a bridge between the religious world and the secular world? To try to create that bridge is certainly a radical alternative. And the person who has most uh, creatively dealt with producing that bridge, and the Book of Blessings is an expression of that, is Marshall Falk. So uh, it is with a great sense of privilege that I welcome her to be our presenter at this time. Uh, her skills are certainly wonderful. And now the ideology that lies behind them and the taste of it uh, is for her to present. With great pleasure, Marsha Falk. Shalom. Oh, it doesn't go any lower. Okay, I need that little box. He's my little box. No, 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 I'm all right. I think I'm all right. You can hear me, right? Gentlemen. I'm going to begin with a psalm for the Sabbath day from the Book of Blessings. Listen. In the clearing where the mind flowers and the world sprouts up at every side, listen for the sound in the bushes behind the grass. Well, I want to thank you, sir, <laughs> for that lovely introduction and for the invitation to be here. Uh, when Sherwin called to invite me, I said to him, what have you been waiting for? <laughs> I've been waiting for years to be invited to this place. Um, <laughs> as, as, a, as, a, as a poet and a feminist and a Jew, three identities that don't always necessarily coexist with the ease. Uh, I have been actively engaged in this struggle for a new Jewish identity probably most of my life, uh, but it may come as a surprise to some of you to hear that I feel completely comfortable as the author of a new prayer book addressing this issue in the context of the Institute for Secular Humanist Judaism, and I hope that by the end of this talk it will be a little bit clearer why and why the seeming contradictions do not seem to me to be contradictions. Um, while it's true that I am both a committed feminist and a committed Jew, and so I'm completely happy to identify myself as a feminist Jew, um, as a poet, uh, I've never felt quite comfortable with any of these labels, you know, with any identification. With, well, I've always felt comfortable with Jew and feminist, but with the I haven't felt comfortable with any of these denominational labels for what kind of a Jew I am or what kind of a person I am. And up until yesterday, I was calling myself a post-denominational Jew for many years until I heard from Tirza that that term has actually been claimed by the Jewish renewal movement. <laughs> and since I don't really feel comfortable in the Jewish renewal movement either, I now have to get a new term. Uh, um, I was reading on the internet, though, there was a reader review of the Book of Blessings in which um, he, he referred to it as a book for post-nostalgic Jews. So I think I'll take, <laughs> I kind of like that. I kind of like that, because nostalgia is one of my least favorite emotions. Uh, <laughs> so I think maybe from now on, I'll just call myself a post-nostalgic Jew. Uh, anyway, it, it's certainly easier to define oneself as what one isn't than what one is, uh, isn't it? It's interesting. Um, anyway, I'm going to be reading from the Book of Blessings today and to talk about how I came to write it as a way of laying out my approach 
to this topic I've been asked to address, which is creating a feminist Judaism. And I intend to focus as much on the creating as on the feminist and the Judaism. But I actually want to begin by talking about an earlier piece of work, which is my translation of the biblical Song of Songs, Shira Shirim. Uh, and this is a much earlier piece of work for me. It goes back 30 years. Because it was while studying and translating this ancient text that I first came to believe that a feminist Judaism was possible. It was my engagement with Shira Shirim, the Song of Songs, a book which is so different from all the other books of Tanakh, a book in which women share the stage equally with men, speaking over half the lines of the text, uh, that led me to begin to speculate about the possibility that there might have been another strand of Jewish religious tradition, a kind of lost strand, you know, like the lost tribe, a parallel thread that coexisted with the rabbinic theology over the centuries and which wove its patterns just beneath the surface of the officially sanctioned and preserved religion. This other strand, as I half imagined it, was made up of the voices of Jewish women and offered an alternative to the patriarchal, hierarchical, dualistic Judaism that we have now come to think of as mainstream. And I wondered, indeed, whether this other strand might be pulled up to the surface today and made visible in the multi-threaded tapestry of pluralistic Judaism. And in that spirit, I immersed myself for many years in the poetry of Jewish women poets, not so well known to English readers, and I began to translate their voices into English. Uh, these were poets in both, writing both in Hebrew and in Yiddish. Um, and if I can find the voices in uh, some of the other Jewish languages, I will. You know, in the Ladino and Judeo-Arabic, it's been very hard to identify Jewish women's voices in those languages. Um, but um, I discovered, as I was doing this, in, in the process of translating these women's voices, that there were certain common qualities that I had found absent or underemphasized in the canonized texts of the tradition. Uh, of course, canonized texts were all male texts. And uh, though none of these voices had ever been made part of the liturgical canon, I believe they had something profound to contribute to Judaism's theological religious vision. Um, so that in working on my new prayer book, The Book of Blessings, I assumed the responsibility of weaving these women's voices into a kind of new canon, and also of adding other threads to the weave, my own, to begin to create a fully inclusive, embracing Jewish feminist liturgy for our time. And I'm going to return to the Book of Blessings in a few minutes, but what I want to do now first is read to you just a little bit from the Song of Songs so that I can give you a taste of the text that first inspired me and launched me on, on this uh, journey to, uh, to, to, to try to recreate uh, that other voice and to create a new, a feminist voice in Judaism. And this is our oldest Jewish feminist resource. The, it's the text that I consider to be foundational to creating a feminist Judaism. And that's this book, The Song of Songs. This is um, my translation of it. The Song of Songs, the Bible's rare collection of love poems. It's also known in English as the Song of Solomon or Canticles. Uh, it's quite simply the earliest literature we have to which we may say with reasonable scholarly certainty that Jewish women contributed their voices. Who actually wrote the Song of Songs? Well, this no one knows, obviously, because ultimately we can't know who wrote any of the books in the biblical canon. Bible scholars, theologians, archaeologists, even literary critics have speculated about this, about the Bible's origins, offering up a variety of theories. Rarely is there serious speculation that its authors were women. We're going to put aside Harold Bloom for the moment. Um, uh, 
Rather, as feminist scholars have repeatedly demonstrated, the Hebrew Bible is a compilation of texts written from male perspectives within patriarchal contexts, providing the theological foundation for two millennia of post-biblical patriarchal tradition. All this is true with one important exception, the Song of Songs. As I said, the Song of Songs is remarkable in the biblical canon because it's the only book in which women speak over half the lines, whereas you check it out in the other books, the percentage ranges from zero to very, very uh, tiny percentage. Um, but perhaps even more remarkably, in the Song of Songs, women speak in, in their own voices, not mediated through the perspective of a male narrat narrator. Not, not filtered through that patriarchal lens, and using language and imagery that's impressively different from that of any other book in the Bible. Uh, so given this, it's uh, not uh, entirely surprising that from rabbinic times to the present, the Song of Songs has been viewed as something of an anomaly, and indeed something controversial. Quintessentially lyric and song-like in nature, erotically charged and passionate, expressive of romantic love and of sensual enjoyment of the natural world, the Song of Songs seems to celebrate a pre-patriarchal world order, if there was such, uh, before patterns of domination and subjugation between the sexes became an accepted norm in heterosexual relationship. Moreover, as if this weren't dangerous enough, the Song of Songs bears no explicit theological message, not even a mention of God's name. It's hardly surprising to discover that it was the subject of heated debate during the rabbinic process of canon canonization. However, Rabbi Akiva saved the day for us with his famous quote, all the ages are not worth the day on which the Song of Songs was given to the people of Israel, for all the writings are holy, but the Song of Songs is the holy of holy. And with that remark, presumably, he ended the debate. The song was officially approved as canonical, and people were then enjoined from singing it in the wine halls which gives you a fairly good indication of where exactly it was being sung. <laughs> Clearly, it was a popularly canonized text long before the rabbis gave it their seal of approval. And it's likely that the song was problematic for the rabbis, both because it was a challenge to the theological order and also because it was popularly embraced. Only by containing the song's uh, sensuality within the context, sorry, I'm a little, every year it's a little worse. You all know the story, right? Only by containing the song's sensuality within the confines of an allegorical structure whereby the male lover was seen to be a figure for God and the female lover a representation of the people of Israel. Were the, ab were the rabbis able to sanction and thus preserve this unique biblical book? Of course, by so doing, they were also able to use the song to model and to justify a dualistic hierarchy of male and female. So this was at once a masterful manipulation and a terrible irony for seen on its own terms, the Song of Songs is a rare exemplar, as I've said, of non-hierarchical, non-sexist relationship. But more about that in a minute. Who wrote the Song of Songs? No one knows, but there is good reason to believe on the basis of the structure and the content of the text itself that it was originally a collection of folk poetry, individual lyrics orally composed and transmitted over an extended period of time before being actually transcribed, compiled, edited, and eventually canonized. Now, if in fact this is the story of the song's origins, then it's reasonable to assume that women directly contributed to its composition. 
And indeed, in the song, women's voices not only predominate, but flower. The variety of women's voices is striking and often lost to us in translation. Not a single persona, but many different speakers utter the words of the song, and they do so in a range of settings with a variety of postures and inflections. And this, all of this yields a collection that reads most convincingly as a compilation of lyric genres rather than a sustained and unified narrative or drama. So what I'd like to do for just a moment is give you a sense of some of those different voices before moving on. So I want to begin by looking at an example of the song's archetypal genre, the one that springs to mind first when we think about the Song of Songs, and that's, of course, the invitation to lovemaking. What distinguishes the song's invitations, beckonings, lover's games of hide-and-seek from those of the song's airs the courtly love tradition and Western love poetry in general, what distinguishes the song from that is that in the song, women are the initiators as often as men. Men are the pursued <laughs> as often as women. And indeed, women are unabashed, forthright, imaginative. Here, for example, is what is poem 24 in my translation. A woman speaks this to her beloved. Turning to him who meets me with desire, come love, let us go out to the open fields and spend our night lying where the henna blooms, rising early to leave for the near vineyards, where the vines flower, opening tender buds, and the pomegranate boughs unfold their blossoms. There, among blossom and vine, I will give you my love. Musk of the violet mandrake spilled upon us. And returning, finding our doorways piled with fruits, best of the new picked and the long stored, my love, I will give you all I have saved for you. It's so great to be a translator because you can stand behind the mask of these other, <laughs> other authors and not have to claim any responsibility, right? You just get to be all those things you want to be. <laughs> all of the examples I, I'm reading today are from this book. My, it's my book. It's called The Song of Songs, A New Translation and Interpretation. It's out of print, unfortunately, in all editions. However, there are a few copies available <laughs> today <laughs> from Skip. Seriously, there's a total of 100 copies left in the world. I own them, and I, I, I gave, I think, 20 or so to skip, because, uh, you know, you might as well get them out there. Um, <laughs> it's been I've many editions of this book over the years. Maybe someday there'll be another one, but it's out of print right now. Um, anyway, this translation differs from the standard Bible translations with which you may be more familiar, so I should just say a word about that. My aim was to open up the locked gardens, the Ganaul of the Hebrew, especially the often puzzling images that have given the comment commentators so much trouble, uh, and, and to give these images new life in the American terrain. Um, I tried as much as possible to deter, the, I, I say the American tr terrain, but you know, I sort of mean the North American terrain, I mean, uh, also European, uh, where English is mostly spoken. <laughs> uh, that is, I, I tried as much as possible, I was trying to carry over the terrain of the Middle East into recognizable language here. I don't mean that I translated the terrain literally. I think I should scratch that the next time I give. Forget that sentence, terrain's a bad metaphor there. 
I meant it metaphorically. I meant English. Okay, I tried to determine the effects that the original metaphors had on their audience and then to recreate those effects in English. And I don't have time to really show you how I did that because this isn't a talk specifically about that. But I want to give you just um, an example of a poem that I translate quite differently from the standard Bible translations. It's spoken by a woman, and so it gives us the opportunity to hear another woman's voice that's quite distinct from the voice I just read to you now, and that's really the point. In the fifth and sixth lines of the first chapter of the Song of Songs, we find that well-known passage that begins, Shichora ani v'nava benot Yerushalayim, and this is often translated, as it is in the King James Version, I am dark, but comely, O daughters of Jerusalem. Now, the Hebrew does not say but. The Hebrew says and. And centuries of Western bias have determined that the Hebrew conjunction here should be translated as but. And I want to tell you that every translation I found in English, French, or Spanish prior to 1989 translated it this way. It's recently, this, and this translation originally came out in 77. And finally, in 1989, the new revised version got rid of but. Um, but uh, centuries of bias determined that there was a contradiction between dark and comely, and that the whole poem, therefore, should be read as an apology. And I read this monologue very differently. I read it as assertive, even defiant, daring, the speech of a rural woman addressing a group of onlookers from a different region and perhaps from a different ethnic group, the city women or the daughters of Jerusalem, and maybe even from a different class. And the speaker tells her audience that she is black, shichora, because she has been working in the sun, and she explains her blackness to her audience without apology. She says that she is black and nava, lovely, like the tents of the nomadic tribe of Kedar or the palatial curtains of King Solomon's court. By paralleling a rural image with an urban image, she implies that her beauty is not only estimable in her own context, but should be so in that of her audience as well. And why am I so black? She seems to intuit their unspoken query. Not just shechora, but shecharchoret, black, black. And because the sun has burned me, shezafatni hashamesh, but shezafatni, the verb meaning burned me, also has another meaning, gazed at me. And elsewhere in the Bible where this word appears, it's linked to the word ayin, meaning I. The eye of the sun has gazed upon the speaker, much as the city women stare at her now. And as it gazes, it deepens the color of her skin. al the speaker says to her audience, do not stare at me as you do, but gaze upon me instead as the sun gazes admiringly. For the sun has made me as black as its own light, the light of dawn. Now, where do I get this image of dawn? It's implied in a very subtle word play between shichora, black, and shichar black, black. We will get the doubling of those root letters with shachar, exactly, you got it right, which of course is the word for dawn, or originally the light before dawn. So the poem is playing with paradox, light that causes blackness, light contained in blackness. Uh, just as it's reconciling these seemingly disparate realms of the rural tents and the regal drapes, which have in common their beauty. And the resulting image is, is, is of, a, of a, an image that is both mysterious and proud. Beneath the cloak of the speaker's skin is a powerful inner radiance, a self-possession that enables her to confront the world the world outside, a world of critical others, including not just the city women, but also her domineering older brothers who have forced her to guard the vineyards. And this is a whole other puzzle in the 
poem, which I won't get into now, because I'm just going to read it to you. But my point is that I think the original is far more complex and interesting than we've been given in the standard translation. So I'll read you the Hebrew, and then I'll read you my translation. Shechora ani v'nava b'not Yerushalayim k'ohalei kedar k'iriot shlomo al tiruni sh'ani shechar choret sh'sh zafatni hashamesh b'nei imi nicharuvi samuni notera et ha'kramim karmi shali lo natarti Yes, I am black and radiant. Oh, city women watching me, as black as Kedar's goat hair tents or Solomon's fine tapestries. Will you disrobe me with your stares? The eyes of many morning suns have pierced my skin, and now I shine black is the light before the dawn. And I have faced the angry glare of others, even my mother's sons, who sent me out to watch their vines while I neglected all my own. Thank you. OK, in the poems that I've read to you so far today, we've heard two very different voices in two very different contexts. And there are yet many, many other kinds of voices in the Song of Songs. I'll read you just one more. Uh, this is one whose voice is so, this is a woman's voice. It's so fiery. Its tone is so passionate and so authoritative, even sermonic for the rabbis in our midst that many <laughs> of the standard translations, which identify speakers in the margins of their text, impute her speech to a man. But don't be taken in. The Hebrew's quite clear. We know from the Hebrew grammar a woman is speaking here to a man. Wrong book. Simeni <sighs> chachotam alibecha Kachotam al zroecha ki azach mavet ahava kashaa kishol kinaa achshafecha rish peesh shalhevet ya maim rabim lo yuchlu lechabot et ahava unaharot lo yishtafuha im yiten ish et kol hon beito bahava boz yavuzu lo. Stamp me in your heart, upon your limbs, sear my emblem deep into your skin, for love is strong as death, harsh as the grave. Its tongues are flames, a fierce, and holy blaze. Endless seas and floods, torrents and rivers never put out love's infinite fires. Those who think that wealth can buy them love only play the fool and meet with scorn. Okay. <laughs> That's the song I'm sorry. That's tough, huh? Uh, I could continue with lots more. I could demonstrate that the song is blissfully oblivious to Western conventions about women's nature and women's role. And that the model of relationship in this text, relationship as mutuality and reciprocity, which I haven't had a chance to show you today, but I could if I, I, if I had time, that the model of relationship uh, of of, uh, 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 of equality and not domination and subjugation, that this model is potentially redemptive for our time. I could also explain that because the, sun, the Song of Songs does not maintain the dualistic division of the world into body and spirit that takes hold so forcefully in, in subsequent Western culture, women are not reduced in the Song of Songs to being merely the objects of male viewers, 
In the Song of Songs, woman is not identified as body, nor is man identified as spirit, nor is woman the muse for the male poet's voice. The relationship between voice and muse, between lover and beloved, in the Song of Songs is gender blind. And I could go on about the significance of this for ethics, yes, and for theology, and I could make the case that the song's celebration of sensuality, of the world of our senses, of our embodiment, has profound implications for our understanding of big quote marks here, spirituality. Uh, I too am uncomfortable with the word, let me say, that by this I mean here in this sentence, the life of the spirit or the life of the mind. I dislike the term not just for all the reasons already put forth here today, but because of its implied dualistic split between the spirit, the mind, and the body, which of course is what we've inherited in Western civilization. Anyway, I'm stuck with the English language, so I use it. Um, I could suggest that we do not need an allegorical reading of the Song of Songs to derive redemptive meaning from the text because the vision it presents of a world in wholeness is sufficiently powerful for effecting social, political, and spiritual change in the world today. I could go into all of that in depth, but I want to move on to the song's airs. The, the voices of women in subsequent eras of Jewish tradition, where are they? Where should we begin to look for them? Well, leaving aside a few isolated, mostly non-literary texts, such as the famous journals of Gluckel of Hamlin, I am sorry to report that we have to leap over more than two millennia all the way to the modern period if we want to hear the sounds of Jewish women's voices flourishing again as they did in the Song of Songs. Did women speak at all during the intervening centuries? <laughs> Undoubtedly they did, but alas, we have no record of it. The enormity of women's erasure from Jewish tradition, erasure from the recorded annals of our history, is so devastating to those of us who are seeking to understand our civilization, our evolving civilization, to understand where we come from, as to be beyond comment. So I won't say anything. Seriously, what can you say? It's devastating. The only comfort seems to lie in doing now whatever we can to uncover what we can and then, of course, beginning to make up for lost time with a vengeance. And that is why I have dedicated a good portion of the last 25 years to translating the work of the modern Jewish women poets I've been able to find, and also why, ultimately, I needed to create a place for these voices that would honor them and preserve them as part of our liturgical canon. It is part of the reason why I had to create a new prayer book, one that would include women's voices in Hebrew and in Engl Yiddish, and as well as in English and one that would express a vision that continued what I saw as the legacy of the Song of Songs. So included in this new Sidur, the Book of Blessings, are poems by the Hebrew poets Rachel, Leah Goldberg, Zelda, Dalia, Ravikovich, others by Yiddish poets, Anna Margolin, Rachel Kuhn, Kadi Molodovsky, Malka Chifetz Dusman, etc. As I was translating these poets, I was repeatedly struck by their engagement with the world of the senses, the world of our embodiment, through which transcendent experience and a sense of meaning, what some people today call spirituality, transcendent experience and a sense of meaning, uh, through the world of embodiment and the senses, this poetry shows us that transcendent meaning can be found. Um, I don't have time to introduce you to all these voices, but I will give you a little taste from the Book of Blessings as I read from it. Um, the desire to make women's voices part of the canon, though, is not the entire story behind the Book of Blessings. Creating a recipe 
for feminist Judaism is more than take the old stock, add women, and mix. It doesn't work that way. Any serious feminist analysis of tradition must critique, and I would argue must ultimately reconstruct Jewish theology. Now why? A secular humanist might well say, why not just leave theology behind? To which I answer that we can't. It's too pervasive, it cannot be ignored, it must be confronted. Theology is too powerful in Jewish civilization and also in the larger societies in which we live to just leave it behind. And I think it's dangerous to leave theology to the theists. <laughs> <laughs> and liturgy, prayer, which is the performance language of our culture, is too powerful a tool to abandon. We need words for our ceremonies and events, whether we call them celebrations or whether we call them services. We need words to commemorate and mark and celebrate the events of the calendar and of the life cycle, and they may as well be well-crafted words, rich, resonant, poetic, and I will argue, they may as well be connected to and transformative of the traditional language that echoes in our civilization's history and in our own ears, and we may as well call it prayer, liturgy. But, another but, I did not set out to be a theologian, and the Book of Blessings did not begin as a theoretical project. It began as a desire of the heart, arising out of a deep need within me, which ignited a spark of poetry, because I am first a poet, which is to say, a lover of literature and of language, and especially of Hebrew literature and Hebrew language, what I call Sfatadam Shali, the language of my blood, English is Sfata Emshali, my mother tongue, and Hebrew is Sfata Damshali, and also, because I love it so, Lishon Libi, the language of my heart. Uh, the image of the language of the heart prompts me to pause in my story and tell you the story of another woman. My great, 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 great grandmother, and yours. Chana. So please allow me this digression now for a moment. If you recall, Chana was an ordinary woman who wanted a child. When she failed to conceive, she prayed. What happened after that turned this ordinary woman into an extraordinary character in the Bible. This is how the Bible tells her story. It's in 1 Samuel. Chana will, and for the sake of time, I'm just going to read the English now because I'm rushing. Chana rose after eating and drinking at Shiloh while Eli the priest was sitting at the entrance to God's sanctuary. Her spirit was greatly pained and she prayed to God, pro weeping profusely. As she continued praying to God, Eli watched her mouth. Now Chana, she spoke in her heart. Her lips moved, but she uttered no sound and Eli took her for a drunkard. Eli said to her, how long will you go on behaving like a drunkard? Put away your wine. Then Hannah replied, saying, no, my lord. I am a woman in anguish, and I have had neither wine nor liquor, but have been pouring my heart out before God. Do not regard, regard your servant as a worthless woman, for I have been speaking all this time out of the greatness of my concern and out of my vexation. Now, at first, this little narrative may not seem terribly remarkable. A woman mutters under her breath. A priest accuses her of drinking. The woman explains herself to him. But the remarkability of this story depends on Hannah's very ordinariness. Because Hannah was the first ordinary person to stand and pray at the entrance to the sanctuary. 
the holy sanctuary where high priests officiated as men offered up their sacrifices. Sacrifices At the entrance to that auspicious site, Hannah stood with no sacrificial offering, with no priest to act as her intermediary, and simply prayed in her own voice, using only her own words. Now, centuries later, when the rabbis were replacing the sacrificial offerings of temple days with a different kind of worship, that of verbal communal prayer, which they called ha'avodah shebalev, the service of the heart, and what ultimately became synagogue prayer, whom do you think they chose as their exemplar of authenticity? Chana. Here's the Bavli, the, the Babylonian Talmud. How many great laws can be learned from these verses relating to Chana? And then they quote from the passage I just read to you. Now, Chana, she spoke in her heart. V'chana hi medaberet aliba. From this we learn that one who prays must direct his sick. <laughs> Not sick, S-I-C-K, S-I-C. One who prays must direct his heart. It's sadly ironic that although the rabbis chose Khan as their model, they directed their teaching almost exclusively to men. Don't tell me it was a generic he, because the truth is that they failed to see the Khanas in their own midst. They neglected to include women in communal prayer, but it's another story that we don't have time for today. So here's the point. The point is that the abandonment of sacrificial offerings in favor of words, many of which were written by the rabbis themselves, who else, was hardly an obeisant submission to authorities of the past. The establishment of synagogue prayer as the normative mode of worship entailed great creative innovation. The Second Temple destroyed, worship practices of Israel in flux. The rabbis sought to lead the way through this transition. And in order to do so, they needed to challenge the historical hierarchy, the histor excuse me, the historical authority of the priesthood, and they needed to assert their own authority in its stead. Now, who do you think became the rabbi's model in this process? Their exemplar for challenging the traditional authority. And once again, guess who? Chana. And here, I, again, the Talmud Bavli, Chana replied saying, no, my lord, lo adoni. They quote the text, right? Lo adoni. Some say that she said to him, you are no lord, <laughs> lo adonata. You are no person of authority, nor is the Shekhinah or the spirit of holiness, the Ruach HaKodesh, with you, since you have presumed me guilty rather than innocent. Are you not aware that I am a woman in anguish? So as you can see, the rabbis attribute to Chana far more chutzpah than the biblical storyteller did. It's clear they admired her, not just for the heartfelt way she spoke to God, but for the clear-headed, audacious way she spoke back to authority, defending herself against the accusations of the high priest. Uh, th their embellishment of Hannah's speech turns her actions into a precedent and justification of their own audaciousness. And so, here's the point. As we today examine the emergence and the creation of new Jewish identities in our own times, the concepts and practice of post-traditional, what I prefer to call, and I'll explain why later, post-nostalgic forms of Judaism. And as we consider the relationship between, on the one hand, creativity, which arises out of our need for beauty and, above all, truth, and on the other hand, continuity with tradition, which helps to fulfill our need for participation in a community and connection to a history. As we do this, I think we need to keep the following question in the back of our minds. As the rabbis brought Hannah as their precedent, is there any reason we shouldn't bring them as ours? I mean, if they were emboldened by Hannah, shouldn't we be too? Or let's put it another way. Are we breaking or keeping with tradition when we follow in the rabbi's footsteps steps, and make our own innovations for our own times. And that's why I refuse to relinquish the title traditional, because I see myself as traditional in this rebellion. <laughs> <laughs> um,
Okay, finally, to the story of the Book of Blessings. I'm really rushing now. Forgive me. Uh, as a poet, I've long been drawn to the lyric intensity and the power of the Hebrew blessing, the bracha. But I first began to write brachot, blessings of my own, for a very specific reason. I was uncomfortable with the heavily patriarchal image of God in traditional prayer. Rather than substitute a new formula for the old, a formula that might itself easily become an icon, an idol, just like the icon gar god, I wanted to expand theological, religious awareness with a multiplicity of images reflecting the diversity of our experiences. And during the course of the 13 years, <coughs> but who's counting, right? I worked on this project, my understanding of the greater whole to which we all belong, my sense of the larger picture, my theology, if you will, emerged and grew, revealing itself to me in unexpected ways, each of which then influenced and became part of the creative process. So the Book of Blessings evolved from its original concept as a slender volume of blessings to a full sidur made up of blessings, prayers, meditations, poetry, introductory essays, and commentary, a big 100-page commentary in the back that explains almost everything I've done here. And even the blessings themselves evolved into a variety of forms, which I want to give you a sampling of today. I don't know how much time I will have to do it, but let me, let me dive in. A big... Uh, uh, the heart of the book is the blessings. A big difference, as I just said, between my blessings and the traditional blessings is that I offer new images to replace the dominant patriarchal image of God as the Lord and King, what's called Shemu Malchut, Adonai Eloheinu Melech Olam, and I use many images to do this. But no matter what the form or content of my blessings, my language is rooted in biblical and rabbinic sources, as well as in texts from later Hebrew literature, so that throughout, this dialogue is in a kind of, uh, this liturgy is in a kind of dialogue with the earliest Hebrew liturgical traditions. Uh, one person called it a kind of jazz riff on it. Um, and, and with the many layers of historical practice and adaptation that succeeded that period, even as it attempts to express a vision that goes beyond rabbinic theology to articulate a contemporary feminist humanist perspective. So, for example, one of the first blessings I wrote was blessing before the meal, and this is you know, one of the simplest blessings and one of the ones that's closest to the traditional blessing, because I, I started out modestly. Um, I took the traditional motzi prayer, you know, the one that you all know, ends with hamotzi lechem min ha'aretz. And I didn't want to say, Baruch atah Adonai, Heinu melech alam hamotzi lechem min ha'aretz. Blessed are you, Lord, our God, King of the world, who brings forth bread from the earth. But I love that phrase, hamotzi lechem min ha'aretz. a beautiful phrase, you know. And I, I wanted bring forth bread from the earth, a phrase of many connections, us, the earth, our food, it's all part of a continuous circle. I wanted an image that would connect those things and awaken gratitude for the body's very nourishment. We say this before eating. So my new metaphor came to me from a very old so source as I was looking for that image, an image of the land, of the Aretz, Eretz, um, I f uh, of the gifts of the earth. I, I came upon that beautiful verse in Devarim, in Deuteronomy, Eretz Nachale Maim Ayanot Utomot Yotzimba Bika Uvahar, a land of water courses, well springs and depths emerging from valley and from hill. And by connecting the Ayanot, the well springs or the fountains from that verse with the word Chaim, life. I created a new image, actually an image that had, hadn't been made before, hadn't been used before, but it had an ancient ring, <laughs> I thought. And the image was enachayim, wellspring or source of life. And so my blessing before the meal uh, now, before I read it, I will tell you about the one other significant change uh, in my blessing before 
uh, for before the meal. In place of that opening, Baruch Atah Adonai Elohim Elcholam. In place of the passive, Baruch Atah, blessed are you. My blessing offers the active verb nivarech. Now, I made this substitution originally. Initially, I got the idea because I was trying to avoid the gender restrictions of the second person pronoun in Hebrew. You is always either masculine or feminism, where, uh, or feminine, <laughs> not feminism, <laughs> feminine. Uh, whereas the first person, plural, imperfect, we, let us, is... Um, gender inclusive, and that was very felicitous. But as soon as I did that, I realized that that was just what I had wanted to do. There was a way more powerful reason to make that pronoun shift. By saying, nivarech, let us bless. Not only are we not talking to a God out there, we're reaffirming and reclaiming the value of our speech. We are taking back upon the human community the responsibility for language and for utterance and for prayer. So here's the blessing. My new motzi'a. Nevarech et ena chayim ha motzi'a lechem min ha'aretz. Let us bless the source of life that brings forth bread from the earth. Now, another of my blessings, the word levarech, bless, doesn't even necessarily appear in any conjugation. It's rather the quality of blessing that's implied in other forms of activity. And I'm, I'm going to skip with examples because I don't have time. You just have to believe me or go read the book. Uh, but that was an early blessing. Before my time runs out, I want to just quickly take you through. It's, I know it's run out already, but I'm going to do it anyway. I'm going to quickly take you through a little piece. Is that okay? I've got to get through the talk. I think it'll be five. <laughs> um, I, I'm going to uh, read from uh, the second. I'm going to read from the, uh, you guys, let's see. Are you, like, needing, this? are you bored? I don't know. They're not bored. I guess. <laughs> just kidding. Just kidding. I'm looking for my place. I have to chatter while I find my place. <laughs> okay. Sorry. It was just so much I wanted to do here today, you know, and it's so hard being here. For You've done a lot. Don't worry. Um, it's hard to say it all in one little piece. I'm sorry. Um, what I want to do is read you from a part of the synagogue service. This book con contains liturgy not just for daily life and personal prayer, but also for holidays, uh, well, for Shabbat and Havdalah, and also for Rosh Chodesh and all the holidays of the month, and now in progress are other volumes for the holidays of the year. So um, I just wanted to give you a little taste of part of the uh, synagogue service or the community service or the Chavura service, what you might consider using uh, when you come together to celebrate Shabbat. So this is from the Amidah, which is the central prayer of uh, all of Hebrew liturgy, and it's my recreation of the second blessing of the Amidah, which in the traditional uh, form is, um, is it's the blessing of Gvurot, God's strength. And this is the blessing that closes in the traditional version with an affirmation of God's power to revive the dead, God as Michaye Metim. Yeah. You might think it's an easy target. This phrase is considered problematic by many Jews today, so problematic, in fact, that both the Reform and Reconstructionist movements have eliminated all references to the revival of the dead in their new prayer books. The Reform movement refers instead to a God who revives all, Michaye HaKol, and the Reconstructionist, the New Reconstructionist prayer book, and also the Old Reconstructionist prayer book, speaks of God as reviving all that lives, mechaye kol chai. What are we avoiding here? What is the dirty word that we don't want to say? What is, this, what is this euphemism all about? I mean, what can you revive except something that is? I understand the discomfort in viewing God as mechaye metim, especially if that brings to mind Ezekiel's uh, vision of the dry bones rising up from their graves in messianic times. But it seems to me that this image is just as easily reworked and re-understood as any other image 
and that we need to grapple with it because this is the only place, this is the primary place, really the only place in the liturgy where we even talk about death. The Kaddish doesn't say anything about death. So to eliminate the dead from our liturgy entirely seemed to me a mistake. So this is how I've reworked it. And I'm now going to read you a little bit from my version of this section of the Amidah. And in this, this section follows the same form. Every section of my Amidah takes the form of first what I call a kavanat halev, a meditation, then a Hebrew blessing and an English blessing, and then a selection of poems. I won't read you all the poems. I'll read the kavanat halev, a blessing, and a couple of poems. We'll wind down. The section is called Magala Chayim, Sustaining Life, Embracing Death. Celebrate life is to acknowledge the ongoing dying and ultimately to embrace death. For although all life travels toward its death, death is not a destination. It too is a journey to beginnings. All death leads to life again, from peelings to mulch to new potatoes. The world is ever renewing, ever renewed. Yivarech et tamayan adei ad mefakeh ma'agal ha'chayim ha'menit u'mechayeh. Let us bless the well, eternally giving, the circle of life ever dying ever living. In the interest of, of time, I will read only one translation. And since I've already <laughs> spoken a bunch of Hebrew, I will make this one Yiddish. This is by Malka Chefetz Tuzman. It's called Bletel. It's a little triolet, which is a rhyming form. Bletel falnet zeinedorim Erd fall bengt, ze kommen fliegeldet. In seer Zeit, ze willen wieder, wieder in Waldblätter fallen nicht, ze niederen. Ze willen wieder mit die Zweigengliederin grün und schmeckendet und wiegeldet. Waldblätter fallen nicht, ze niederen. Erd fall bengt. They come in legal dick. Leaves don't fall. They descend, longing for earth. They come winged. In their time, they'll come again, for leaves don't fall. They descend. On the branches, they will be again green and fragrant, cradle swinging. For leaves don't fall, they descend, longing for earth, they come winging. Well, <laughs> Aka's a great poet, and if you, if you uh, enjoyed that poem, you might also want to take a look at a book back there called With Teeth in the Earth, Selected Poems of Malka Chavis Chusman, because I worked with her for many years and I have a full-length volume of her translations, published right here in Detroit by Wayne State University Press. God, I was dying to read you my poem from this section, but I don't really have time because I need to make my theoretical points to sum up, right? Ugh. <laughs> <laughs> what did you ask me the question? What was your poem? And then I have a chance to answer it. <laughs> 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 Look, <laughs> there's a lot to read and to say, but I won't be a hog. I need to wrap up. I wanted to address the key question. So maybe the key question. So what, what is, where is the divine in all of this? You know, why do I call it prayer? Wh where is the divine in all these various passages I've read to you today? And if you are thinking this, then I must tell you honestly, nowhere in particular, potentially everywhere that attention is brought to bear. And here, 
is where I am liable to be either adored or stoned by both the traditionalists and the staunch secularists among us, because here's the point. If everything is, is capable of being made holy, as rabbinic Judaism teaches us with its scrupulous attention to the details of ordinary life, then surely we need not, we ought not localize divinity in a single apt word or phrase. We ought try to find it in our lives wherever we can. And this brings me to where I began, why I feel comfortable discussing a prayer book at the Institute for Secular Humanistic Judaism. You see, I think that secular humanists and feminist Jews, and many postmodern Jews and those who call themselves post-traditionalist Jews, have a great deal in common. We share the liturgical calendar, the holidays and Shabbat, and we need a way to mark time. We are all seeking an honest language, an authentic voice in which to do so, in which to express our values, to be who we are, as I say in my blessing to the children. In the context of Jewish civilization, Jewish community, Jewish peoplehood, so many of us are uncomfortable with the term God. Feminists who find it exclusivist, gendered, hierarchical, secularists who find it false or meaningless, reconstructionists and humanists who intuit the divine within us rather than outside of us, poets who find the word just tired and old, and no longer working as a metaphor to awaken any sense of surprise and joy within us. So many of us find it a dead term. So many of us are engaged in the same struggle to find more meaningful ways to connect to the greater holes beyond our individual lives and whether we seek those connections in community or through heightened awareness of our bonds with all humanity or through respectful coexistence with the rest of all life on the planet, and I see those things as concentric circles or maybe a spiral, whether we choose to point toward that experience through the language of sacrality and theology or through the language of ordinary experience, and what I've tried to show today is that through poetics we may be able to compress those and make them one and the same. Ultimately the differences between us, between our various idioms, may not be as great as we had thought. When we are speaking our truths and not platitudes, when we are trying to express the language of the heart informed by the awareness of the mind, we may ultimately hope to transform the very concept of holiness, kedusha, into a daily practice of heart and mind and body, body engaged in the world as unified, as one. And now I'll get off stage. <laughs> Thank you very much.